Right, hey, good morning, church. Good to see you all here today. Good to see all of you folks uh, joining us online. Hey, you know, storms happen in life. Out here in California, uh, we're used to earthquakes and fire storms, and if you live in other places of the country, you might have to deal with hurricanes or tornadoes. That stuff sounds pretty scary <laughs> to me. Now, it's one thing to have to experience a storm. It's another thing to go chasing after them, right? You know, uh, some years ago, just outside of Oklahoma City, a large, dangerous uh, tornado hit. It was classified as an E4, and it had winds up to 200 miles an hour. Wow. And uh, it, it cut a, a swath when it hit the ground of two and a half miles, a path of just complete destruction and, and devastation. It, it, was, it was such a powerful uh, tornado, they said, that yes, houses were being taken off their foundations uh, and lifted into the air, just like on TV, right? Cars were flying, uh, livestock and, and all these things. Now, here's the crazy thing, in my opinion. When this huge, dangerous tornado hit, uh, college frats were getting in vans to go chase it. Um, professional storm chasing companies actually had tours. You could pay money to get in their van and, and you could go chase the storm. I don't get it. You know, we, we don't have earthquake chasers here in California, but they're chasing these tornadoes. And uh, man, uh, unfortunately, one of the vans with people chasing the storm, it actually got caught up in the vortex of the wind and people lost their lives. It was a crazy situation. We're going to be talking about storms this morning. And, um, but you know, storms come in different varieties, different shapes and sizes as they affect our lives. And sometimes we can weather the storms that come our way, and other times we struggle, if we're honest. Things like the loss of a job can be a storm, or failing or struggling in school, dealing with illness or the loss of a loved one, marital tensions in the home, problems with uh, your kids, or facing a major disappointment in life. A storm can also come in the, in the form of difficulties at work, not getting along with coworkers or a boss. It could be struggling with alcoholism or an addiction. Or it could uh, be financial issues that uh, are just causing struggle and difficulties. For a lot of us, just this whole last year has been a storm, right? With with COVID, but I do have some good news, and this is where we're starting uh, in, our, in our message notes this morning. The good news about storms is this, that God goes with us. That's what the Bible teaches. God goes with us in the storms. You know, I, I love the story of Jesus and his 12 disciples, and they're out on the middle of the Sea of Galilee, which was really just a, a big lake in northern Israel. And, and Jesus was asleep in the rear of the boat. He was tired from teaching and ministering. And somewhere in, in the night, a storm came upon the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus' disciples were doing everything they could to keep their boat afloat. And remember, a lot of them were professional fishermen. They knew the Sea of Galilee very well. They're professionals. But at some point, uh, they had lost hope and were fearing for their own lives. And, and here's Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat. You remember the story. And it tells us in Luke chapter 8, verse 24, and they went and they woke up Jesus saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And Jesus awoke and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. Just as Jesus was in the boat with his disciples during that storm, folks, I'm convinced that Jesus is always in the boat with you and I when we experience different storms in our lives. 
Well, this morning we're finishing up our series in the book of Acts that we've called The Movement, the movement of God's church and how it grew and began. And we're looking at the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and we come to his final voyage, and it was a literal storm that he experienced as he was being transported as a prisoner from Jerusalem to Rome. Let me give you a little background on our passage today. Chapter 27 of the book of Acts takes us to about 59 to 60 A.D. Paul had completed three missionary journeys in just over 10 years. He had gone around to, uh, to nations like Syria and modern-day Turkey over in uh, Ephesus and places like that. He had made his way up into Macedonia and started the Philippian church and, and into Greece where he established many churches. And his ministry was, was flourishing as he encouraged the churches through the letters that he wrote to them, which is what we have in most of our New Testament. And so Paul, as he would visit the churches that he planted, he would ask and, and make a collection for the original church in Jerusalem, those, those, those Christians who had trusted Jesus as their Messiah. They were heavily persecuted by their fellow Jews. And so Paul makes his way back to Jerusalem, and then he gets in conflict again with the Jewish religious leaders. They accuse him of teaching heresy, and they throw him in prison, and there he sits for two years. Well, finally, Paul appeals his case, because he's a Roman citizen, to Caesar. And that's what puts into motion the events of chapters 27 and 28 in the book of Acts, as Paul is put on a ship with other prisoners and cargo uh, on their way from Jerusalem uh, over to some of the Asian countries and finally through their way up into Italy and to Rome. I have the map right behind me which shows you uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles that Paul sailed. But here's the thing, in the middle of this journey, the ship got involved in a storm. It got caught, and it was a terrible storm. And uh, the men were doing everything they could to save the ship, but at one point, it looked like the ship would be lost and everyone's lives with it. And it's amazing, through these last couple of chapters in the book of Acts, how the apostle Paul took his faith and trusted in the Lord each and every step of the way. And I think it's got some great lessons for you and I as well, when we experience the storms of life. So before we go on, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, storms come in life. It's not always smooth sailing. There are disappointments. There are difficulties. There are challenges. And yet, we don't have to experience these storms alone. You're there with us. I pray, Lord, that through the Apostle Paul's journey as a prisoner on the Mediterranean Sea, that we would learn from his faith how to handle the storms that life throws at us. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but when I'm experiencing struggles in my life, challenges, storms. I'm looking for something to hold on to <laughs> so I don't slip and fall. And this morning, I'm going to suggest three anchors that you and I can hold on to when we're in the middle of a storm. And the first is the anchor of God's presence. So we pick up our story in Acts chapter 27, starting at verse 20. So it says this, now remember, they're in the middle of the storm. And it says in verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay upon us, that's Bible talk for saying they were in a real doozy of a storm, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. <laughs> they, had, they had used all of their skill, all of their abilities to try to save the ship to try to handle 
this incredible storm, and they got to a point where they gave up hope. They had lost hope, a terrible place to be. Yet Paul had faith. Paul was a prisoner on that ship, sailing on his voyage to Rome to face Caesar for his supposed crimes of heresy. Paul had faith. And in the midst of the storm, he held on to the anchor of God's presence. So in verse 21, it says, Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. I love Paul. He's so confident. (laughs) They were on the island of Crete in a safe shelter. And Paul had warned them. He said, he said to the captain and the soldiers, I don't think we should continue the journey or there's going to be incredible loss. And he'd had a vision from God, but they didn't listen to him. So they set sail, and now they're in the middle of this storm. They're about to perish. They've abandoned all hope, and Paul addresses them. And the first thing he says, good old Paul, you should have listened to me. We shouldn't have set sail, but you did. Verse 22, yet now I, I urge you to take heart. Paul only got on him for a little bit. Now he wants to encourage them. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you must stand before Caesar. I love Paul's words. The God to whom I belong and I worship Paul was so aware of God's presence within his life. And he was so aware that he was never alone, no matter what he faced in life. Why? Because he belonged to God. If you trusted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you belong to him. You belong to the Father. And his Holy Spirit indwells you. We never go through trials or difficulties or challenges or storms in this life alone. Isn't that good news? Because we belong to our Father. Paul went on. He said, listen, in verse 24, God has granted you all who sail with me. He's granted all of you your lives, okay? Verse 25, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run the ship aground on some island. (laughs) Listen, we need to grab hold of the anchor of God's promise to be with us. And remember, no matter what we face, we're never alone. The children of Israel in the Old Testament, God told them to to come into this land that I have prepared for you. I want you to take it. Here was the problem. The land was filled with uh, inhabitants. There were other nations and tribes who were not followers of the one true God. They were idol worshipers, and they were established in the land. Their cities were fortified, and they were big, large warriors, children of Israel, were unsure, and yet God promised that he would be with them. Those well-known words in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, God says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Isn't that awesome? Folks, God is with you wherever you go. Yes, that was written thousands of years ago in that time, in that context, but all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that you and I might be equipped for every good work, and I believe that applies to our lives as well. God will be with us wherever we go, whatever circumstance 
we might be dealing with. He's there for us. <laughs> you know, when I first came here, um, people would share with me, all right, Pastor, we got to tell you a little bit about our church because we've been through some rough waters. <laughs> and they started to share with me some of the storms that Calvary has weathered over its 60-year history. They'd say, you know, pastors have come and pastors have gone. Some on good terms, some not so. Uh, we've been through uh, storms of scandal. We've been through storms of church splits. We've been through the storm of the recession that hurt our finances tremendously. And God didn't want me to feel left out, so he gave me the storm of COVID that, this last year to, uh, to be able to uh, help us endure and make it through. But I want to assure you, God has never left this church in 60 years. God's presence is with Calvary. It might look a little different than it has over the years. The people might change here and there, but I truly believe that God's hand is upon this place and that he has a mission for this local church body to continue its outreach to this community and beyond. God's presence is with us, church. There's a second anchor to hold on to, and that's the anchor of his protection. Now, the natural response for a lot of us is to protect ourselves and our loved ones when storms hit, and there's nothing wrong with that. We just have to remember to not leave God out of it. Paul Shipp was in a storm for two weeks, and some of the men started to panic even more than they had before. We pick up our story in Acts 27, verse 30. Now, as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, <laughs> they lowered the ship's lifeboats into the sea under the pretense or the, the lies of laying out anchors from the bow. So the sailors, you, you had soldiers on the ship that were guarding the prisoners, and you had a Roman centurion in charge, you had all the prisoners, and the Apostle Paul was one of the prisoners. And then you had the sailors that took care of the ship. They'd been in that storm. They knew what the seas were like. They knew their situation was hopeless. So, secretly, they were going to abandon ship. That's what's going on. And they said, oh, we're just going to check out the lines here. So we're going to lower the rowboat. They were going to get out of Dodge, all right? They were going to leave but Paul knew what was going on, verse 31. And he said to the centurion, the Roman military leader, and his soldiers, unless these men, these sailors, stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. It's all of us or none of us. That's what God told me. They've got to stay with the ship. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Hopefully the sailors weren't on it. They made their way back on to the boat. <laughs> but they let go of the lifeboats. Everybody needed to stay with the ship and trust that God would protect them. It goes on in verse 33. Now as the day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food saying, today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense, in, in the intense stress and pressure of trying to keep this boat sound so we don't sink in the middle of this storm. 14 days you've been fighting without food. You haven't taken anything. Can you imagine being on an ancient wooden ship with all these people fighting a storm? For two weeks straight without a morsel of food? It's amazing. You can understand their, their desperation. And so Paul says, therefore, verse 34, I urge you, take some food. It'll give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. What a promise. Isn't that great? Paul says, listen, God is with us and God will protect us. Matter of fact, Stay with the ship. Take some food. 
be strengthened, not one hair from any of your heads is going to be taken. If you do what I say, have faith in my God. Sounds pretty good to me. Not a hair of our head? Really? Really? So then Paul, verse 35, and when he had said these things, he took some bread. He gave thanks to God in the presence of all. He broke it and he began to eat. Now I can imagine all these other sailors and soldiers on the ship and they're watching Paul, thanking God. He goes, hey, get, get the barrels, bring out the bread. He breaks it, he thanks the Lord and he starts to eat. And everybody's watching him. I'm hungry. Are you hungry? I'm hungry. Are you hungry? I'm really hungry. That guy, he's talking to his God and he's eating. He says we should eat. What do you think? I think we should eat. So they all started to eat. Finally, after two weeks, and it tells us in verse 36, then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. Now notice it says we were in all 276 persons. Uh, Luke is including himself. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. Luke must have been on that ship with Paul. And they were 276 soldiers and sailors and prisoners on an ancient wooden cargo ship. Wow. And when they had eaten enough, then they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Why in the world would they throw out wheat? food into the sea. They had to lighten it up. They had already ate. They'd already had the promise of God's protection that not a hair on their heads would be harmed. So they figured, well, let's do what this guy Paul says. And they lightened the ship even more by throwing some of the food over. <laughs> wow. That's how the Apostle Paul led the men of that ship in the middle of the storm. Holding on to the anchor of God's protection, let me ask you, how do you respond in the middle of a crisis? For some, it's easy to blame others when you're going through a tough time. Or, or maybe blaming God, looking up to heaven and saying, Lord, I, I pray to you. I, I, I read your word every day. I go to church. I'm involved in a ministry. How could this happen to my son? How could you allow my little boy to have this disease? I, I thought you were there to protect me, to be with me, God. And, and we can blame. And it can shipwreck our faith. For others, we can doubt in God's goodness. I thought you loved me. <laughs> I thought you were going to be there for me. Why did this happen? Why am I struggling with this, God? This doesn't make any sense. And we can doubt his love and care for us. Hmm. Not the Apostle Paul. He held on to the anchors of God's presence and his protection. You know, there's a story of a little town that was between two rivers and it, it, it was flooding. And the emergency workers came and evacuated all of the people except one man who was stubborn. And he'd cross his arms and he'd say, I don't need your help. I've prayed to God and God will deliver me. And he said, come on. He said, nope. Well, the flood rotters kept rising so that cars couldn't even get to the man's house. Finally, a guy with a lifted four-wheel drive truck came by and he said, come on. Come out. I, I've got this truck. Get in my truck and I'll take you to safety. The man looked at him and said, nope. I don't need it. My God will take care of me. So he said, all right. Well, the waters continued to rise. And the man had to go inside and, and stand on his, on his dining room table. And a rowboat came by. The man said, sir, get in my rowboat and I'll take you to safety. He said, no, go save somebody else. I don't need you. I've prayed to my God and he'll protect me. So the man rode away. Finally, the waters kept rising. And the man had to climb on the roof of his house. And the water was coming up to his ankles. And a helicopter came by and lowered a ladder. 
And they had a megaphone and said, sir, climb up the ladder. Climb up the ladder and we'll take you to safety. He looked up with his fist and he said, I don't need you. God will save me. And the helicopter had to fly off. Well, the floodwaters kept rising and the man eventually fell in and perished. Well, he made it to heaven and he wanted to have a talk with God. And he said, Father, I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. Why did you let me drown in that flood? And the father looked at him. He said, my son, I heard your prayers. I sent you a four-wheel drive truck. I sent you a rowboat. And I sent you a helicopter. Why did you send them away? I think God has a heart and a desire to protect us. But sometimes we get in the way or we don't recognize his protection when it comes. Back to our story. Acts 27, 39. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land. So they saw some land. But they noticed there was a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. This thing is just like a Hollywood movie, right? I mean, it's, it's an incredible story. They're, they're in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea in a huge storm for two weeks. The men are exhausted, tired, beyond their limits. They're ready to give up. Others are ready to take the lifeboat and abandon ship. There's a prisoner there named Paul trying to keep it all together, saying, no, my God is with us. He will protect us. Take some food. Everything's going to be all right. We'll run the ship aground. They see some land, and they're ready to you know, drop the anchors. Let's take her in. It's amazing stuff. Wow. So it says in verse 40, So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind. They made for the beach. Isn't this great? This is like Steven Spielberg type of stuff, right? But they struck a reef, and they ran the vessel aground, the bow stuck and remained immovable in the reef, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. Can you picture it in your minds? They see the sandy beach. They drop anchors. They cut them loose. They set the sail. They're ready to get some speed, ram the ship right into the sand. Easy landing. But as they're coming in, they didn't see. They hit a reef. Bam! The bow of the ship sticks. The stern comes up, the waves are hitting it, tearing the ship apart. Wow. That's drama. That's drama. <laughs> Verse 42. So the soldiers are there. They've got a job to do. Take care of those prisoners that are on board, right? So the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners. And that would have included Paul, by the way, lest any should swim away and escape. They weren't going to let any escapees happen. But the centurion, that Roman military leader, wanted to save Paul. So he kept his soldiers from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. And the rest of you guys on planks or on pieces of the ship, every man for himself, grab a piece of wood, float yourself into shore. Good luck. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Wow. <laughs> Amazing story. God protected Paul and the prisoners from being killed, and all 276 aboard that ship survived. You know, I really believe that there are many times that God chooses to protect us when we're in the middle of of the storm. Whether we realize it or not, I think God protects us from unknown hardship and pain and crises and temptation and even evil. And yet sometimes, folks, sometimes 
God allows us to go through the storms. I don't know about you, but he's allowed me to go through the storms in life. Rather than pulling me out or saving me from the pain and the consequences, God, in his wisdom and understanding and sovereignty, allowed me to go through some very painful things in my life. And I didn't always know why. And it wasn't always easy. My job was to remain faithful. And no matter what, to be able to sing to the Lord, it is well with my soul. For you're with me. You protect me. Your love and your word sustains me. So are you in the middle of a storm right now? Hold on to the anchors of God's presence and his protection. There's a third anchor, and that's the anchor of God's provision. We have to remember that our God has the ability to supply all of our needs, our physical needs, our emotional needs, our relational needs, and our spiritual needs. And God provided for Paul and his companions on this ship. It tells us in Acts 28, verses 1 and 2, so after we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness. I guess Luke's trying to communicate that they didn't attack us when we made it to the beach. For they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. Poor guys, insult injury, right? Their ship breaks up on the reef. They've all got abandoned ship. Some of them can swim to shore. Others have to hold on to a piece of wood or something from the ship. They make it in. Then it's cold and starts to rain. <laughs> but God provided. The native inhabitants made a fire for them. If they had s'mores, I'm sure they would have made s'mores for them too. You know, they were, they were being nice. They were being kind to these people. God had provided for them. And then it goes on. In verse 7, now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Publius must have been the Roman official of the island, and he was hospitable to all those on the ship and entertained them, took care of their needs, bandaged their wounds, provided fresh food and water and perhaps clothing. He took care of them and gave them shelter for three days. Then it says in verse 10, they also honored us greatly, Luke writes, and when we were about to sail to make their last leg of the journey to Rome, they put us on board with whatever we needed. God provided for Paul and all those who were with him. And they experience God's presence and God's protection and his provision. And so can you and I through the storms, the difficulties, the challenges, the disappointments, the struggles that we face. So are you able to trust God to provide for you? Even when maybe you're out of work to provide for your family or when you're sick to provide assurance that he's in control. Or maybe you've gone through a divorce that he might provide practical and emotional needs for healing. Maybe you're single that he might provide your deepest needs for companionship. Perhaps you're a parent with troubled kids. Are you able to trust that God will provide wisdom and resources to help them? Or maybe you're struggling with a temptation. Do you trust God that he will provide the way out like he promises in his word? Maybe you have a relationship or even a marriage that might be struggling. 
Do you trust God to provide the love, patience, understanding, and forgiveness that's required for healing to come? Maybe you're just like a lot of people this year, just overwhelmed. <laughs> this year needs to end. <laughs> a vaccine needs to come. We need to get back to normal. And you just feel overwhelmed. You've got to trust God that he would provide the strength that you need for each and every day. You know, I find encouragement in a little chapter of the Bible. It only has six verses, but it contains each and every one of the principles of God's provision, protection, and presence that we've talked about this morning. It's in Psalm 23, written by David. And it says this, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want because God is with me and he will provide. <laughs> he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That's provision. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the storms, I will fear no evil, his presence, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They provide guidance and protection. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. David was confident of God's provision in his life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, we are children of a loving Heavenly Father who is bigger than any storm you and I might encounter. He truly is our source of hope when all is lost, our anchor to hold on to. Let's talk with God. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your servant Paul, for his example of how to handle the storms when they come. His example of faith as he held on to the anchors of your presence, as he trusted in your protection, and as he received your provision. Lord, we pray those things for ourselves. Help us to grow in trust and faith with each new day, even when the storms come. In your name we pray, amen.